the burgeoning awareness of policymakers and the public in general about, gosh, if I want solar panels, if I want wind turbines, if I want electric vehicles, I've got to have these materials. Welcome to the Limitless Energy Podcast, and today it's my pleasure to welcome Debbie Strusacker, mining policy expert and co-founder of the Women's Mining Coalition. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today. Mining is very important to us. We're a lithium-ion battery company. Obviously, we are uh, very interested in policy surrounding lithium mining, and I'd like to understand a lot more. So I really appreciate you you coming on. First of all, I want to talk about your background. So you're a geologist by training. That's correct. I have two degrees in geology, a bachelor's and master's degree. In Nevada? No, my uh, bachelor's degree is from Wellesley College, which is outside of Boston. Yeah. Yes, uh huh. And then my master's degree is from the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana. Okay. Are you, are, so are you an East Coaster? No, I'm a Westerner. I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado. And ended up in Wellesley, huh? I ended up for four years of my life in Wellesley. I married an Easterner. My husband's from uh, northern New Hampshire. And I, in fact, I just came back from a trip to Maine and New Hampshire. And I love it back there, but I love it here more. So how did you get into mining? Was it at, in Missoula? Well, I think I actually got into mining because of my father. My father had a family company. He was a mechanical engineer, and he ran a family-owned business that manufactured truck-mounted rotary drilling equipment that was used in the mining industry, oil and gas industry, and water well exploration industry. And so he was tangentially um, involved in the mining industry, and I just saw that growing, growing up, and I, I think it had an influence on me. How did you get started in that field? Well, I had a degree in geology, um, graduating from Wellesley with a bachelor's degree and needed an entry-level job. And there were jobs in the mining industry at that point in time. And I went to work for, actually, I went to work for Bethlehem Steel in Lehigh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And they had a geology division that looked for not just iron ore, but for also base metals. And so I started out my career in economic geology, which, you know, another way to say mining geology. And um, spent about the first decade or so with a rock pick in my hand and as, as an exploration geologist. And then just by serendipity in the mid-1980s, I transitioned into environmental permitting, and that kind of led me into my current um, mixture of what I do, which is environmental permitting and government affairs for companies that are exploring for minerals and building and operating mines. So you started with Bethlehem Steel. And in Nevada, the mining historically is around gold and silver, right? That's right, although we have pretty significant copper deposits and some molybdenum deposits as well. Uh, lead and zinc, say, around Eureka. But yes, you know, we are the silver state. We were founded uh, with mining in the Comstock load, which was mainly a silver deposit, at least initially. Are, are you interested in the history of mining? The Comstock load is obviously oh. from... The history of mining is fascinating because really the history of mining is one way to look at the development of the Western U.S. I mean, the mining history really has so much to do with um, the development of the West where our towns sprang up. And, of course, you know, uh, the history here in Nevada with the Comstock load is very significant nationally because Nevada became a state. You know, we're the battle-born state. It became a state in 1864 so that President Lincoln would have enough electoral college votes to win the election. I was aware, yes. Uh -huh. you know, we are, of course, battleborn batteries, uh -huh. and uh, yeah, that, we're, we're very proud of that title. Uh, so it is interesting that the society, like in Nevada, developed around the mines, but at the same time, the mines provide the minerals necessary to progress society and technology in general. So the policy around mining has evolved to be able to sustain the development of technology, correct? Yes. So where are we now? If we, if we, let's move on now from steel, gold, and silver now to lithium. First of all, how is lithium different? 
Well, I'm not sure that lithium is all that different in that the the regulations that pertain to development of a gold and silver mine are essentially the same regulations that pertain to a lithium mine. And that's both on the federal and state levels. And here in Nevada, we have as a state some of the most effective and comprehensive mining regulations of any place in the world. In fact, our regulators um, at the Bureau of um, Mineral Reclamation, Regulation and Reclamation are often sought after by countries around the world for how to regulate mining projects properly, and in particular for the financial assurance program that was developed really here in Nevada so that when you explore for minerals or develop a mine here in Nevada, whether you're on private land or public land administered by the Bureau of Land Management or the U.S. Forest Service, you have to provide a bond, a financial assurance instrument to guarantee that your operation will be fully reclaimed when you are done, whether you you know, at the end of the day aren't successful in developing a mine or whether you develop a mine that's going to operate for 40, 50 years, you have to provide financial assurance to guarantee that mine will be rec reclaimed. And right now, our regulators, our state regulators and federal regulators, work under the terms of a memorandum of understanding where they co-manage this financial assurance program. And we have just in Nevada um, over 3.4 billion dollars of financial assurance to guarantee our mines and our exploration sites will be fully reclaimed. I think that's a pretty impressive accomplishment. Are the regulations in Nevada stringent even for the other states? I'd say they are state of the art and yes they are stringent. Uh, many other states in the country certainly have comprehensive regulations as well but our regulations are are very um, stringent, they're comprehensive and I think importantly they're always evolving. So, you know, you, you shouldn't be required to be clairvoyant if you're a regulator. You should be able to adjust regulations um, when new conditions become evident. And working closely together, the Nevada mining industry and the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection have refined and continue to uh, fine tune the regulations that apply to mining here in the, in the state. And I would be remiss in saying that the federal regulators have similarly comprehensive regulations, and they dovetail very well under that memorandum of understanding that I mentioned a, uh, a little earlier. And how does it compare internationally? Certainly you expect things to be more lax in China, uh, but there's a lot of mining, there's a lot of lithium mining in South America. How, how does it compare to various parts of the globe? Nobody does it better, safer, and cleaner than we do here in Nevada and in general in the U.S nowhere. So um, it's kind of an apples and oranges comparison. So if sustainability and environmental responsibility is something that people are concerned about when sourcing their lithium or their copper or their graphite or their cobalt or their nickel and all of those minerals that are absolutely essential to renewable energy, the best place to develop them is here in the U.S. And we have good resources of many of those minerals, but unfortunately we have um, permitting issues here that make it harder to develop mines because of permitting timelines. And we have a lot of opposition to mining here too that also leads to a protracted permitting process. So it's a little unfortunate then that it's harder to set up a mine here, but we do it better and safer, so we end up buying resources from overseas, and it's done in a more environmentally destructive way. Not only that, but it also doesn't make any sense from a, a carbon emissions footprint analysis. So, you know, if you could choose to get your lithium from Nevada and your Tesla, and you need lithium, do you want to get it from Nevada, or do you want to have to get it from China and incur that CO2 footprint that is necessary to transport minerals around the globe. So, you know, if you look at this just from a big picture, it's an environmental win-win. The more we obtain our critical minerals from the U.S. compared to even 
even friendly countries. I mean, if we could get it here, the carbon footprint of getting lithium here is less than the carbon footprint of getting it from Australia. So what is the argument for the opposers of mines? Well, is there any validity? I think many people who are opposed to mining are misinformed about what modern mining is all about. I mean, there's no question that mining in the past created environmental problems, but so did every other industry. I mean, Ford Motor Company doesn't build F-150s today the same way as they build a Model T, for heaven's sakes. So the mining industry is no different, except that what we did is still outside. You know, you, the Ford factory of the Model T era may be gone, but the mines of the early 1900s are not. And so their environmental problems are still visible. And people who are kind of anti-development capitalize upon those um, pre-regulation environmental problems and try to get people concerned about mining by misinforming them that today's mines are going to create the same problems as the mines of 1912. And that's just, of course, ridiculous. So the misinformation is accidental or it's deliberate? Oh, it's very intentional. It's very intentional. I mean, people, individuals may be uh, unintentionally misinformed and, you know, then that's the mining industry's job to try to provide them with the correct information. But there are many, many um, NGOs and, and groups that just are ideologically opposed to mining. I think if they thought it through, as, and, and I'll tell you what, this um, recognition of the need to reduce our carbon emissions and the indispensable role that critical minerals plays in that is an inconvenient truth for them. Mm -hmm. And they are busily trying to convince the world that we still don't need to mine, we can do this through recycling. We can have a circular economy. And, you know, that's aspirational. Maybe someday recycling can be a very significant component of supplying the mineral stream that we need. But right now, there just isn't enough material out there yet to recycle to fulfill a meaningful portion of that demand. Certainly not lithium. Certainly not lithium. Let's talk about lithium. There's one active lithium mine in the United States right, right now, and we desperately need more lithium. And there are a number of projects going on. In your view, could that happen faster? Well, let's look at the Thacker Pass project, for example, in um, Humboldt County. Um, that's um, Lithium Nevada's project, and it's very exciting that the, that project is underway and being constructed, but there can be no doubt that it was delayed through litigation. So litigation is a common denominator in the permitting process because litigation is sort of the last phase of the permitting process, and it frequently delays the development of of mining projects and all sorts of other projects as well. Was there one main sticking point for the Thacker Pass project? Oh, that litigation was, in my mind, a throw the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. Okay. And there so were that, many elements of that litigation. But that project obviously is moving forward. Yes. So they're, they're beyond yes. that now. And, and not only that, but um, the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals rejected the plaintiff's demands and, and uh, upheld the BLM's approval for the permit that allows that project to proceed. We do hear about endangered species. We've, you know, we've heard about the sage grouse and, and, and the buckwheat down in, in the Rhylite Ridge. Right. Is there any credence to those concerns? Well, um, all of those endangered species can certainly be a complicating factor at any mining project or any other kind of project for that matter. But impacts to an endangered species can be mitigated. It's not necessarily a uh, complete showstopper. For instance, Ioneer at Rhyolite Ridge, they're doing something very exciting with cultivating the team's buckwheat at a, in a greenhouse facility up here in northern Nevada. So... Um, you know, mining projects, one, one of the things about a mining project that is an immutable truth is the ore deposit is where Mother Nature and the forces of geology put it. It cannot be moved. 
you can maybe reconfigure some of the facilities around it, but that ore deposit, if it's going to be developed, has to be mined right where it's been discovered. So things like a critical or an endangered species, we have to be able to accommodate that. We have to be able to mitigate impacts to a, uh, an endangered species if they occur through other kinds of um, mitigation measures, like what Ioneer is doing to uh, cultivate the, the buckwheat here in northern Nevada, or in places you might be looking on the case of sage grouse with compensatory mitigation to enhance off-site habitat to um, offset the unavoidable impacts to habitat where your mine is. We do go above and beyond here, right? And if, and, and if you don't allow these mines to continue, we're going to get the materials elsewhere where there are endangered species and there's other environmental effects. And so I don't know why that's not viewed, it's not viewed more favorably that at least we are trying to mitigate these, these effects here. You know, I can't answer that question except to say the other part of the equation that seems to be missing from the opposition to mining here is people. Because if you care a lot about people, then you want them to go home safely every night after they've worked at a mine. And that is certainly not the way mines in other countries, or some other countries anyway, are operated where there's very little attention to worker health and safety. I mean, heck, you know, there's still child labor being used to mine cobalt in the uh, DNC. Well, where else would we get cobalt? Well, you could get it from a deposit in Minnesota, except for the fact that this administration has just put a world-class deposit of copper, nickel, and cobalt off limits to mining for 20 years. Is there enough cobalt in Minnesota to offset what we can get from Congo? I don't know how that you know weighs out in a volumetric sort of way, but heck, it's a start. Mm -hmm. And you know, why would we not? try to take responsible advantage of the mineral resources we have here rather than get them from anywhere else. I mean, again, there's just a lack of balance. Um, those deposits are in an area, uh, they're on national forest lands where uh, they're near an, uh, an, a wilderness area, but they're not in the wilderness area. And I'm well convinced that the state of Minnesota has very, very stringent environmental protection regulations for mining projects, and that that project could be responsibly developed in a way that you know we could have a win-win. It would be a, an environmentally responsible mine of the copper, nickel, cobalt, and um, there's also platinum and palladium in that deposit that we need for our for our renewable energy technologies. There's no question about that. I mean, all of those metals are are important. Yeah. And, yeah. So. Uh, well, let me sh switch gears here a little bit. You are co-founder co co -founder of the Women in Mining Coalition. Women's Mining Coalition. Women's yes. Mining Coalition. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that. How did that, why did that get started? Well, <laughs> I started the Women's Mining Coalition in 1993 with two other women geologists here in Reno. And our concept at the time was um, President Clinton had just been elected and the House and the Senate were both uh, dominated by uh, Democratic majorities, and there were two very problematic mining law bills being considered in the Congress. And we got the idea that, well, maybe we could take a group of women, geologists and other women who were involved in mining, back to Washington, D.C., to go talk to um, a number of newly elected uh, women lawmakers. Um, that was also the year of the woman in Congress. The, that, that year in 1992, more women than ever had been elected to Congress. So that was the germ of an idea, and we made our first trip in March of 1993, never thinking that it would be but a one-off thing. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of pinching myself today that 30 years later, we're still making annual trips to Washington, D.C. to talk to lawmakers about the importance of mining. And, you know, lawmakers now have an elevated understanding of that, given the focus of critical minerals and renewable energy. And we're still arguing about the same kind of mining law issues that we were 30 years ago. But we have women from all over the country um, in coal and hard rock mining that attend these fly-ins, and they are... You know, they span the gamut from technical people to uh, 
women who work for vendors and suppliers and equipment manufacturers like Caterpillar. And we usually spend um, the several days on the hill, usually th three or four days on the hill, and often get in as many as 200 or more meetings with, with House and Senate offices. So it's a, it's, a, it's a, you know, again, I'm sort of astonished that we're still at it 30 years, but that's how we got started. What were some of your biggest wins? What did you convince the lawmakers to do? Well, I do think in 1993 and 1994 that when those uh, first mining law bills were being considered that we and others, and we certainly didn't do it single-handedly, played a role in those bills not getting passed. I mean, sometimes you have to measure legislative victories by stopping a bill rather than um, getting a bill over the finish line. So I think we had a, played a role in, in defeating those very onerous bills that, that sought to limit mining on public lands. And frankly, those bills are still out there in an, you know, several reincarnations later, and they're still trying to stop mining on public lands. I mean, if they would be enacted today, the mining industry here in Nevada would look very, very different since most of our mines occur on public lands or a combination of private and public lands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it is such important work considering the direction we're going now. Yeah. We need to onshore not just production, but the resources. We need to onshore where we get the, the natural resources, and, and it's a matter of national security now. Absolutely it is, and that's been a key focus of the Women's Mining Coalition for a long time. We were concerned about critical minerals before it was cool, so... <laughs> <laughs> for at least the last 10, 12 years, one of the things we have talked to lawmakers about is our dependency on mineral imports. And we, as one of, uh, you know, we would have flyers and we'd walk into the offices with a, a, a group of papers that we wanted to review with the lawmakers or their staff. And one of them was always a chart that uh, we would get from a, an annual publication by the U.S. Geological Survey uh, it's called the Mineral Commodity Summary. And that annual summary always has a chart that shows, it's a bar graph that shows how many minerals and what our percentage of dependence on um, minerals and which countries those minerals come from. And if you look at an evolution of that chart, it's just terrifying because we've become more and more and more dependent on countries for our minerals. And right now, we're something like 100% dependent on 17 minerals and more than 50% dependent for another at least couple dozen. And that's just an untenable situation. As you mentioned, it's really, it's really threatening to national defense and our economy. Yeah, we unfortunately made the decision to outsource the the mining of the minerals and also the man just manufacturing in general that was just a misguided i think it was in more of an investing decision you know that we just did not invest in in the infrastructure for it here no and, and we're playing catch up now we are and this also i think was influenced by a uh, you know i guess it was maybe taught in business schools in the 90s and early 2000s the in vogue just in time inventory concept that you don't have, you know, a supply of the stuff you need on hand, you just keep it rolling. You know, you get it just in time. And while COVID sure, you know, the pandemic certainly illustrated the danger of that when we were all frantically shopping for paper towels and toilet paper and this, that, and the other, because nobody had an inventory. Um, it was very short-sighted when you think about it. I mean, uh, especially, and I think really our, our military leaders have always been concerned about it. One of the projects I'm working on is a project in Idaho called the Stibnite Gold Project that is a source of both gold, as the name suggests, but also antimony. And antimony is a critical mineral, and it is absolutely essential component of munitions. And the Department of Defense has given this project a couple of grants because they have determined it is the only source of antimony that has the right chemistry to make uh, meet military specifications for what they need for munitions. Well, that's terrifying because <laughs> well, we get most of our antimony from China right now. Yeah. 
Wow, that's yeah. that is incredible. Well, as you noted, you were into critical minerals before they were cool. Did you ever think you'd see a day when they'd become cool? No, I'm flabbergasted. Here we are. Here we are, and then it really is the inconvenient truth. I mm. mean, uh, the the burgeoning awareness of policymakers and the public in general about gosh, if I want solar panels, if I want wind turbines, if I want electric vehicles, I've got to have these materials. So all of these renewable energy technologies are very materials intensive, and the world simply doesn't have those materials right now. And there are you know, projections by many credible sources of just skyrocketing demand for lithium, among others, copper, nickel, cobalt, graphite, aluminum, and it's a problem. Well, keep doing the important work that you're doing. Uh, we appreciate it, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed talking to you today. Thanks very much. Thank you for joining us today on the Limitless Energy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on any of your favorite podcast platforms.